Let's now develop a simple model of the housing market that will help us to analyze a theory which specifies that there is a relationship between the mortgage rate that people pay and the price of houses which they buy. So here is our example. We are going to construct a model of a housing market and this model, once we have developed it, may actually help us to, help us to make predictions about the way individuals behave when mortgage rates change. So, before we do that, before we get into the details of the model, let's just remind ourselves of the various ways in which we can go about explaining what we observe as economists. All of these elements go into our models. Like scientists in any other discipline, we can engage in verbal explanations. We can explain what our theories or what our hypotheses say. But we also use diagrammatic illustrations to explain our ideas. In addition to that, we can use mathematics in the form of algebra. And of course, if we wish to validate or to test our theory transformed into a model, we have to gather data. So that brings us to the analysis of data by means of statistical tests. So our model of the housing market. We propose in our theory that there is a causal sequence running from mortgage rates to the cost of buying a house and therefore to the price of houses that exists in the marketplace. So we are going to hypothesize that changes in mortgage rates lead to changes in house prices. How do we go about doing this? Well, we will construct a model, and we will construct a model on the basis of data that we gather, data for mortgage rates and house prices. So if we observe in the data that house prices and mortgage rates are moving in a predictable fashion, we might reasonably infer that house prices and mortgage rates are correlated with one another and perhaps even causally correlated with one another. We will then move to be able to using the model with prediction. So here's our model in a diagram. Suppose we start with a particular observation at a particular point of time and we observe that when mortgage rates are 6% in the economy that house prices are represented by a certain dollar value. We have house prices on this axis and P1 will be the average price of a house when the mortgage rate is 6%. So what we will do is we will simply draw a point here given by the gray circle which relates the value of 6% on the mortgage rate axis with the price P1, a certain number of dollars, on the horizontal axis. So this is one point in two-dimensional space relating the mortgage rate to the average price of a house in the time period when the mortgage rate was 6%. Now suppose we come to another time period and we observe that the mortgage rate has changed and that we observe also that house prices have changed. Specifically, if the mortgage rate that we observe has gone from 6% to 5%, and simultaneously we observe that the price of houses on average has increased from P1 to P2, then we could draw another point in this two-dimensional space representing that observation. So now we have two points in this diagram. And those two points suggest that there is a negative relationship between the mortgage rate and average house prices. If we were to do this exercise for a whole series of time periods, we might be able to observe more, the mortgage rate at different levels, and we might correspondingly find that house prices varied as a consequence. Having done this, suppose we draw a line through the points, what would we get? 
we get something like that. In this instance, we just have two points, so it's very easy to draw a straight line through those two points exactly. If there were other points in this diagram, there is no guarantee that they would all lie exactly along the straight line that we have drawn here. However, we can grasp the general idea here. If we gather data on variables that we think are correlated, or variables where one causes the other, and we can draw a line through the points, then that is suggestive of a relationship between the two variables. So, in general, a fall in the mortgage rate leads to an increase in prices. So, in this instance, there is a negative relationship between the two variables. It is negative because the line slopes downwards. So, we could conclude this simple illustration by saying that with all other things held constant, that is to say we haven't changed anything in the world other than the mortgage rate and allowed the house price to vary, the downward sloping line represents a negative relationship between the two variables. So the previous representation of the model was in graphical form, but we could also write the model in simple linear algebraic form. We could write an equation for the line that we have drawn through the two points relating the mortgage rate to the price of houses. And we will do that presently. So, when we do that, we're going to work with straight lines. You notice that we didn't draw a curved line through the two points we had earlier on, even though there was no reason to believe that the line would be absolutely straight if we were to have more observations linking mortgage rates to prices. But there is something nice about straight lines when we want to work with economic models. The critical aspect of a straight line is that it is very easy to work with algebraically. It can be described completely by its slope and by the value of one of the intersection points with the axes. So we will write an exact mathematical form for the equation corresponding to the line we had in the previous diagram very shortly. First, let's examine the different kinds of data that we might use in the construction of an economic model. So a variable is a measure that can take on a different value. And data are the actual values that these variables take on. We can have different kinds of data. We can have data that come in time series form. We can have data that come in cross-sectional form or we can have a combination of the two in the form of longitudinal data. Let's start by taking an example of data that are in time series form. Here are some data that define the price of houses in Vancouver in the middle column for different time periods described in the first column. So Q1 in the first column refers to the first quarter of the year between 2006 and 2012. So for example, we have a table of house prices by time period here. So in the year 2006, the first quarter, someone or some agency has gathered data on the price of houses in North Vancouver and they have determined that the average price was $580,000. If we move forward in time, and the same exercise has been done in the same neighborhood, and the data have been tabulated, then what this table tells us is that by the time 2012 quarter one rolled around, the price of a comparable house in the comparable area had gone from $580,000 to $870,000. So this then is a very simple tabular representation of data that link house prices to time. So this is an example of data that are in time series form. Column three over here, we will look at this uh, presently. 
the data here are in the form of a price index, and price index forms have certain attractive features which we will explore. And the source of these data is given in the footnote below the table. We could also represent these data by a plot or a graphic. And indeed, if we took the data in the previous table and we took all the values, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven values between 2006 and 2012. And if we tabulated these values on a graph, we would get the diagram you see in front of you. In 2006, that is the value of the average house price. And that was $580,000 we saw from the preceding table. So each point here in this graphic represents a combination of a time period and a price. So here we have the time series data represented in graphical form. We have plotted the data and joined up all of the combinations of time and house value. At this point, we want to issue a warning about the interpretation of plotted data. In this graphic, you see a fairly strong upward trend to the data. However, it's always very important to examine the values on the axes because the visual impression of the graphic is not always an accurate one. So what we will do in the next slide is to illustrate this same set of data by means of two plots. And each of these plots will give us a different visual interpretation, even though they contain the same information. If you look at these data, or if you look at these plots, you will notice two things about them. The left-hand plot has a graphic which gives the impression of strongly rising house prices over time. In contrast, if you look at the graphic on the right-hand side, you get the impression that house prices are not rising very fast or very steeply. But exactly the same set of information is contained in these two graphics. What have we done to give a different visual impression? What we have done is we have compressed the axis in the second figure relative to the first figure. So by compressing the axis that we have, by compressing the vertical axis in the first figure, what we do is we correspondingly compress the plot. And consequently, the plot in the second graphic looks flatter and gives the impression of uh, a series of prices which is not rising rapidly at all. In fact, however, in our data in the table, we went from 2006 to 2012, and we saw that there was quite a substantial increase in prices over a relatively short period of time, an increase that is not conveyed very strongly in the right-hand graphic because of the way that the data are presented. So what do we do when we look at graphics? It's always important to look at the scale of the axes. Do not be confused by the fact that a graphic has a steep slope to it or a flat slope to it. That may be indicative of something important, or it may be just a trick used by um, an advertising agency. Let's now look at cross-section data. Cross-section data, as the name implies, describe data at a given period of time for a cross-section of sources. So here, for example, in this graphic, we have information on 
unemployment rates in different provinces and for Canada as a whole by month. So in the first column, we have unemployment data for the month of January 2012 for a whole series of provinces. So these data define a cross-section of the Canadian economy at a given point in time. So cross-sectional data usually describe or usually present information on a particular variable at a point in time for a series of different sources or different jurisdictions.